It's Ollie Gu on BBC Radio Guernsey. Now, Guernsey's LGBTQ community celebrating its diversity with events for Channel Islands Pride. We've heard a bit about it uh, throughout the week. Part of the lineup, though, includes screenings of Cabaret and 52 Tuesdays. So today, in among our usual film reviews, we're going to be talking about LGBTQ representation in film. Winter Tyson joins me alongside Liberates uh, Lauren McSwiggan and also Nick Delisle. Welcome to the programme. Morning. 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 So let's talk about Cabaret. Because that is, uh, we rolled my classic A to Z uh, of films, and if you don't know what that is, I've been uh, getting a bit of a classic film knowledge over the past however many months it might be now, probably like six or seven yeah, months. Yeah, well, we were, we were supposed to be doing G this month. G, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we but rolled we it back to it. C so that I could watch Cabaret, 1972 mm. film. Um, and as we all know, I'm not very clued up on old films, so I hadn't seen it. Um I, I don't know what it is about older films. I just I never have a, an inkling to just go and watch them. So this has been quite a good uh, little tool for me to educate myself. Anyway, Cabaret, what a peculiar film. Yeah, it's it's an interesting film. It's filmed by um, Bob Fosse, who people will probably know uh, more from things like, well, immediately from stuff like Chicago. Uh, Cabaret itself, a very famous musical as well. Um, and it's about uh, that kind of moment in sort of Weimar Germany, um, when you have this, uh, you know, f- we've gone past the First World War, we're heading towards the Second World War, we're boiling over into uh, the rise of the Nazi Party, etc. And it's based within that whole kind of uh, cabaret uh, club culture that was uh, that was burgeoning at the time. Uh, the film itself is, I think it's one of the classic bits of cinema uh, for several reasons. One, I really like Bob Fosse's films. I think all that jazz is one of the best films ever made, uh, which is one of, which is kind of his autobiographical film. And Cabaret is of a similar style. Bob Fosse is very good at breaking his films down. You, you don't normally see kind of uh, a, a sort of a through line narrative in this one. What he's done is he's taken uh, the musical version of Cabaret, which itself was based on sort of the writings of Christopher Richwood, and he's taken it and kind of unmusicalized it in a way. So the musical numbers aren't necessarily characters turning the screen and saying here's what I feel like and here's what's going on uh, but they comment on the action and but what I really like about it is it's a film about performance and whether it's the performance of being a new person in a new place whether it's the performance of whatever you're representing yourself as um, kind of uh, sexuality wise class wise as well and also it's got a lot of respect for the actual performance of the cabaret artist uh, Liza Minnelli in it, and she's just incredible. Every time I watch this film, and I've seen it quite a lot to the point where, when I was re-watching it for, the, for this, my wife said, oh, I'm watching cabaret again. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah, we are. Um, what, what always strikes me is you, Liza Minnelli is so good, uh, both on and off stage within the film, that you're surprised at how good she is every time you watch it. I think she's got such an such an amazing presence. And with Liza Minnelli, it's, uh, I kind of get a bit frustrating that we we didn't see more of Liza Minnelli being as awesome as she can be sort of throughout cinema. There should be a whole lot more Liza Min- Liza Minnelli sort of throughout our, our filmic life. But there's, there's, I mean, she's still about. She still works. She works an awful lot. But her sort of um, her performance as Sally Bowles in this film is just an absolute knockout. And the, like I said, the film itself is brimming with everything. It's brimming with gender issues. It's brimming with politics. It's I didn't get... I mean, and, and I know I'm, I'm sure they were there and the idea of, of showing it as, as part of Liberate Channel and Pride, but I didn't get the gender issues really within it. I didn't sit... They didn't kind of come to the fore for me. Well, there's a whole... Well, so within Cabaret... You, I didn't notice them, I suppose. Remember, we're, talking about a film, we're talking about a film from 1972... And this is a film which kind of takes gen, uh, kind of gender and sexual fluidity in its stride, in a way. And there's songs about uh, the songs. Of, so there's a the song about a uh, menage a trois. There's a song, you know. There's uh, kind of the sexuality of the performances themselves. But also there's kind of the personal drama of that sort of central, uh, that central love triangle. Plus there's the issues of kind of there's there's some there's religious issues in it as well. Uh, we've kind of the whole sort of uh, Jewish. Kind of identity coming coming through the film as well, so it's it's one of those films where suddenly this you know this stuff is it, it's kind of just out there and it just exists within the story and 
to me, what I quite like about it is it's the 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 sort of the, the gender and sexuality of the characters is treated kind of as a personal drama. It's not treated as a plot point within itself. And I think that's probably I why think. it didn't appear so apparent to me, because I almost expected it to be a plot point, and yet it just kind of unraveled itself well, within the within the film, which maybe is a much better approach. Um, then kind of otherwise making it the full uh, point of the film. But, I mean, what what do you both think think of the film Cabaret? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, those issues aren't treated as a big, important lesson in the film. They're just part of the story, and we wanted to show that with our choice of films. But, I mean, it's a film... I like I watched it on and off for many years. It's, it's an interesting film to be picked, partly because... It's based on the writings of Christopher Richard. Uh, in Cindy Guernsey, we showed his film, the film based on his book, A Simple Man. Single Man. Sorry, um, stop that thing. Um, a Single Man with Colin Firth, and that did very well. And it's based on his memories and his writings. So you've got a gay writer. You've got a gay icon in the main role. Liza Minnelli, for her parentage and her role partly in this and other things, is a fairly strong gay icon. She's very much so. And the film itself came at a kind of key point in American cinema where things were opening up. A couple of years ago, um, before this, there'd been Midnight Cowboy with John Voight and Dustin Hoffman as Hustlers on the Street. And there was a very strong gay sub-theme there. Um, had William Friedkin's Boys in the Band. So it comes at a key moment in American cinema where kind of censorship uh, barriers are breaking down and a more realistic treatment of sexuality is possible. So it's th- also got really good tunes in. <laughs> it mm. does have good tunes. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a good part musical. Um, but do you think then in 1972 it would have had perhaps more of an impact to somebody watching it then than it may- maybe did for me watching it today? Um, I think it would have done, but I mean, as Nick was saying, the early seventies was a very, very contentious time in cinema. I mean, if you take sort of like the tail end of the sixties, you've got um, you know Sam Peckinpah reaching his kind of violent sort of peak, as it were, and then kind of films like Straw Dogs and Clockwork Orange and sort of up to nineteen seventy five stuff like Sallow, um, and you know, very cha- and we we watched The Devils just uh, a couple of months ago, yeah. and you know, it's a very challenging and interesting time in cinema. And I think, kind of one of the uh, one of the sort of issue, one of the things about cabaret is when you compare it to a film, kind of uh, with similar issues now. So we, um, we watched uh, the Danish Girl came out quite recently, and so one of the striking things about cabaret is that it's not the kind of the, the story of sexuality within cabaret isn't the story of um, a kind of. Uh, I think kind of the road to crucifixion, which seems to be a lot of a lot of gay a lot of gay cinema that is sold to kind of a a, a straight kind of homogenized uh, you know the you know the normal audience as as the marketing men would have it. What we have are films like Philadelphia and A Single Man and Brokeback Mountain, and they do represent a truth of you know stories for a particular community, but they're also sold as I think um, these kind of almost like crucifixion stories where. Here we go again. We got the kind of the stations of the cross of what's going to happen to what's going to happen to all of these characters. And the way Cabaret treats it is, this is all just a melting pot of all this stuff going on. And in the background, we've got this this kind of this kind of rising menace, which is why it's, if anything, it's Cabaret is kind of a kind of a, cel- a kind of a celebration of a film as well as a kind of a you know saying, oh gosh, we've got an end of an era coming up. And if you think about kind of where politics was starting to go. In the early seventies, we've got sort of the um, kind of I suppose what you have the freedom of the sixties and kind of coming up to sort of the seventies hangover, all of that, and you've got all of that stuff represented in the film as well with this, you know, that chilling scene uh, tomorrow belong where the child sings tomorrow belongs to me and it's Hitler Youth, it's the Nazi Party, and of course one of the characters you know gets involved in uh, kind of a uh, gets, well gets beaten in the streets by the uh, by the Nazis for for kind of um, for for insulting them, but it's not cabaret. Isn't a Stations of the Cross kind of film. It's a it's a cel- it's a celebration film of you know of the way people were living their lives and these kind of 
and it's a nice encapsulation, I think, of kind of an artist of a moment that's kind of an artistic explosion where people were coming from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of lives. You know, there's an American, there's a Brit. They're, what are they doing in the cabaret clubs of you know sort of thirties, early thirties Germany? And it's kind of this ex- explosion of sort of creativity that um, that the film represents, which I think is is very um, interesting. And I don't, I'm not so sure audiences at the time would have had maybe as much of a reaction to it as we'd have to a similar film right now. Uh, I, I actually, you kind of put it into perspective a bit for me because the inclusion of the of the Nazis seemed a bit odd, like a, ne- a kind of a weird added extra to the rest of the story. But actually, if we're, we're looking at the film talking about a specific period in time, then actually why not include all of that mm. and show it in a, in a very real-world kind of application way? Um, in terms of cinema not... Uh, being, you know, trying not to do the kind of crucifixion st- style um, type of gay cinema. What do you think? Do you think it's better that it plays it out in a way that Cabaret has? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there is a place for big, important films like Brokeback Mountain, but you want diversity in film. And if all of them are just the big, depressing films where they all die at the end, you need to have something more cheerful than that. You need different tr- stories. I mean, obviously, there's huge diversity within the LGBT community. And you need to show different stories, different aspects of that. They're not all the same. And do you think that's happening enough, then, in current cinema? No, we? definitely not. Definitely not mainstream cinema, anyway. What, what do you think the actual impact of having enough cinema, which does it in the correct way, has on the LGBTQ community? I mean, I wouldn't say the correct way. It's not wrong to show the mainstream cinema that they have, but you can't understate the importance of seeing yourself represented in cinema. It's incredible just to see trans performers acting as trans roles. I mean, recently there's been some controversy over Matt Bomer being cast as a trans um, woman in a film, and it's not wrong to do that, but it can mean a whole lot more to see trans actresses actually succeeding in the um, media. And so the controversy is over the fact that they could have used a, yeah. a trans uh, actor instead. Yeah. And uh, what, what do you think, Winter, then? Do you think we'll slowly make a move into this more kind of inclusive like that that's it's no longer a plot point it's more of a something which happens as the story progresses yeah i mean there's sort of two arguments here one's the um kind of the accessibility of um getting a film made and the sort of new kind of we've got more avenues than ever to kind of watch film and for film to be distributed um but kind of the argument the, the argument against that being there being quite a rosy outlook for kind of a a more multicultural kind of multi-faced cinema is um, kind of the narrow-mindedness of what is a business a business machine and marketing. Um, you think about something like um, the recent uh, hacks of Sony of Sony's emails, and they revealed that they didn't do an equaliser too because uh, I think the, the phrase they used was essentially "black doesn't travel" because Denzel Washington cannot sell in a in in thing. And we're talking about someone who's one of our mainstream. You know, Hollywood icons here. Even, apparently, the Sony are petrified he won't sell in Eastern Europe and China. So we're not going to do Equalizer 2. So, so, so you is think it of, what they, they kind of consider a minority group and they'll only do films in a very specific way for minority groups? Uh, and, and that's kind of how marketing and cinema is working at the moment. But this is, this is, this is kind of... Your question there is kind of key because you're saying they. And the they is a, the, the blank face of... You know, corporate Miramax and Disney, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's, you know, we're moving towards a more kind of democratic entertainment world, as it were. And you've got more, like I said, there's more more avenues to show to show films. There's 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 more interesting things you can be doing. I mean, the Mallard are showing a film called Holding the Man on the 12th of September, um, sort of the night before the uh, Pride screenings, and it's on Netflix. You know, you can go, you can watch it on Netflix, and it's it's quite a you know it's quite a good it's quite a good movie. So that film's available, you know, to tons of houses immediately, and it doesn't have to. You know, if 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 a company like Netflix, who are taking more and more chances with the type of stuff they're showing, and we say whenever we say sort of taking chances, we don't mean these stories are no good. We mean they they're just saying, hang on, we think there's a market. Mm. We think there's a market because you know people buy our stuff, and the more people that buy our stuff the better will be. But what goes against this is 
we want, you know, marketing people want to sell stuff in more conservative countries, uh, like China, for instance, um, like, you know, Eastern Europe and Russia. They want to sell stuff worldwide now, which is why the majority of our cinema is aimed at kind of the sort of, you know, uh, action, less less words, more action, kind of generic, you know, let's just have generic white guy doing generic white guy stuff and heroics and all that. And that's why cinema is pretty homogenized. I mean, you look at kind of the mallard at the moment and what's on what's on there. Yeah, we've got a poster up for holding the man. Um, we there's barely a you know apart from Will Smith, there's barely a black face on cinemas. There's you know there's barely a story. Uh, there's there's barely any LGBTQ sort of stories being put into cinemas, and when they are, they tend to be aimed at kind of a straight audience. And I I don't think I'm remiss in saying this. They tend to be about gay men. Yeah, yeah, they're, absolutely. Because there's, there's a massive bias still towards white guys. Hmm? You know, so it, the, what I want to see is just more stories about different people and different experiences, stuff I don't know about. I mean, I didn't like The Danish Girl. I didn't think it was a particularly well-made film, uh, sort of from a technical point. Um, but I know somebody who um, has never considered kind of transgender issues and always thought it was kind of a bit, you know, just people being a bit weird, went to see The Danish Girl and said, oh, right, I get this now. I get that it's somebody becoming who they are. It's not somebody becoming a different person because they're a bit odd. It's somebody, you know, it, it's a story of someone becoming themselves rather than, you know, rather than the opposite way around. Mm. And so these, you know, these films aren't valuable. I'm not saying, you know, the same old stories, the crucifixion stuff isn't a great value and, and shouldn't be made. I'm just saying, look, you know, it, it's nice watching Cabaret to see there are, other, there are other avenues to go with this stuff. And do you agree, Nick, that diversity, that opening up and trying new things and you know following perhaps more niche um avenues works it's i mean what is the actual importance um of cinema culturally does it have a significant impact do you think i hope it i think i think it does over the many years it does it is a kind of univ it is a universal language whatever language a film is in because people still talk about it you talk about film and to a certain that travels internationally in a way television doesn't and television at the moment is for lgbtq issues really interesting you have um oranges and new black for example um you have um the transparent on oh, Amazon. Brilliant. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> the and um, the much more interesting from a race and gender and sexuality point of view. Indeed, one of the key British visual drama cues in this regard is probably the BBC version of Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Am I getting? Yeah, um, <laughs> too many oranges around the place now. Mm-hmm. Um, that is in a, has an importance actually in excess of many of the key films of the period, which played to a much smaller audience. Um, a couple of years before, Orange is Not the Only Fruit, there came a key film called Young Soul Rebels, a film about um, is a, a from Isaac Julian, who is a Turner Prize nominated. I can't remember if he's one artist. It's about. It's set in the, the Silver Jubilee. It has race issues and gender issues and sexuality issues. It was expected to be the big new thing, and in the end it sort of wasn't. It ha- it's still remembered, but the, it, the cultural impact is nothing compared to that of um, Orange is Not the Only Fruit. But it's still there. The film is... It got distributed in a way that the TV series didn't. It got a release in America. It got a release in other countries. Um, so I think it's that that is important. And what's interesting is that Hollywood is sort of playing catch-up and doesn't really know what to do with it. Um, we were discussing, outside before we came in, the recent version of Stonewall. And Stonewall is a key act in gay history, the Stonewall riots in New York in 68. There was an earlier film from the 90s, a very low-budget British film, which I really like. Um, the newer version, again, not huge budget, ultimately it seems to have fallen between two stalls. None of us have seen it. It is directed by a gay director, Roland Emmerich, who is better known for his big blockbusters, Independence Day, The Day After Tomorrow. And yet, somehow, he's managed to create 
in style a big mainstream film, but appealed to absolutely nobody because he's whitewashed history. He's made it pleasant and nice for everybody to watch, and yet somehow it didn't actually reach the multiplexes. It became a niche result, a niche film, a niche audience says that actually, no, we don't want to see that. We want to see this, which is much more realistic, something we can appreciate. So I have no problem with big, fluffy, Hollywoodized epics, if they sort of work. I think... Danish Girl is an interesting example of that. That actually seemed to appeal, um, went down extremely well with families of trans in, in, um, individuals. Less so with perhaps trans people themselves, but certainly the families found it a very moving film. So there are films out there, they've always played to a niche audience. And I think one of the, he was there, was American cinema, we had a, a new black cinema in the 90s. You had films like um, Minister Society, um, Boys in the Hood, and then they could be spoofed. Don't be a minister South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. That is a genuine <laughs> film. I've seen it. It's not very good. Um, but they could be marketed quite cheaply by divisions of studios and placed in areas where there is a large black community. And you could identify where those were. You can't do the same with the LGBT community, which is why I think there's no equivalent from the large studios of gay cinema. Lauren, do you think that film companies have a responsibility to offer something culturally to every community that <laughs> that, that watches film? That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> definitely. I mean, it's not necessarily the importance of creating new roles, but even I can remember being as a teenager really disappointed watching um, Constantine because I loved the comic books, and in those he's a bisexual male character, which was really rare in cinema, and because it wouldn't appeal to many people, they made him straight in the in the series, and I was gutted. And, and Keanu Reeves. Yes, also that. <laughs> but it's not that they're just not creating the characters, they're actually making existing canon bisexual or trans or gay characters straight or side gender or anything. They should just... They're not keeping pace with the diversity shown in modern society. I mean, the success of Orange is the New Black shows that audiences are massively not swayed by, like, LGBT characters. They're happy to watch them. So Hollywood just need to catch up. We're going to take a short break for a bit of music on BBC Radio again. So you're talking about LGBTQ representation in film. We'll have a little chat about uh, 52 Tuesdays as well after this from Roy Orbison. You're listening to Ollie Gue on BBC Radio Guernsey in the studio with Winter Tyson, Lauren McSwiggan and Nick Delisle. We're talking about LGBTQ representation in film. We've discussed Cabaret and that is one of the films that you're going to be showing. Is it next week? Uh, yeah, that's... No, it's a week after. It's Thursday the 15th. Thursday the 15th and also showing 52 Tuesdays. Uh, so when's that when, when That's is that on screening? Wednesday the 14th. Wednesday 14th. We're also going to be showing a free under-18 youth film on the Thursday. But we haven't decided which film yet. <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> so, uh, 52 Tuesdays, what is that about? Nick? Uh, well, it's... it's On one way, obviously, it's very different to cabaret. On another way, it's very similar. It's very interesting to see how time has changed. 52 Tuesdays follows. It is literally what it says. It is 52 Tuesdays. And it follows a teenage girl whose mother is transitioning... From, um, from a woman to a man. During that time, she has to go and live with her estranged father. But she will meet up with her mother as she transitions over 52 Tuesdays, giving the film the title. And the film was shot over 52 Tuesdays. And the central individual who is transitioning was, is somebody who was, at the time, going through... Um, the surgery themselves, and so the act, the actor was actually going through the was transition. Going, was actually period. transitioning, and they shot it over the fifty-two Tuesdays. And indeed, as the kind of the surgery and the treatment worked and didn't work, and there are issues that fed back into the drama, so it became a kind of drama which was being rewritten by reality. So it's, it's a mixed. It's not quite a drama. It's not quite a documentary. It's somewhere between the two. It uses both to really interesting and, and affecting results. And have you seen it, Winter? I haven't seen it. No, I'm I'm quite looking quite looking forward to it because, um, like we were just we were just talking about um, during during the song, um, it, similar to uh, Richard Linklater's uh, Boyhood film, 
and just the I- the idea of sort of creating a story that follows kind of the reality of transitioning and what is this what does this mean and again adapts as the as the individual changes and goes with the challenges it just sounds like an absolutely sort of fascinating project and an interesting way of making film and i think this is this is part of the idea of you know when filming equipment becomes more available and when we can go out and buy a nikon uh handheld camera and use that to shoot sort of hd quality footage you will see i think you will see more films like this appear films shot either kind of under the radar kind of surreptitiously or films shot alongside kind of the life cycle of a you know of an individual living a life rather than you know the sort of hollywood system of you know film is literally akin to just setting fire to money actually shooting film but when you've got these this small equipment when you've got these kind of smaller teams of filmmakers and artists and sort of individuals who are going through sort of challenges and and you know are happy to share that challenge in fictional or documentary format then you're going to get more interesting stories i'm just going to leap in there very rudely which reminds me of the film last year tangerine which was set in a trans it's like oranges and tangerines the you? Ab- it's it's <laughs> the- I don't know why. Um, there's a fruit joke to be made. I'm not going to be the one to make it. Um, I would have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> but Tangerine, it was shot on an iPhone. And it fo- it's, has trans actresses as themselves, you know, tra- um, genuine trans performers playing them. Um, and it is on the streets of... L.A. Yeah, L.A. Uh, one, an iPhone. So that is a piece of equipment I have in my pocket now. I have what you can shoot a proper film on. Got released. The reviews were fantastic. It was a serious Oscar contender. There was serious Oscar talk about the performances. I'm going to become a filmmaker. <laughs> oh, uh, just... Nothing interesting happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The, I mean, again, some of the issues were raised that the actual director is not trans. But even so, the film itself got very good reviews it got and it was very popular and did 52 tuesdays work did you enjoy that as a film i haven't seen it the reviews are amazing the, the, the reviews have been, i mean it, it got talked so well about it i thought you'd seen it, <laughs> it actually um when it when it did get a release it actually got um a really interesting write-up in sight and sound which is the most influential from a certain perspective film magazine in the uk um, and they gave it a very interesting write-up, and they interviewed the director. So there is, it's, it's again, it's a film that's got a proper release. This isn't sneaking out somewhere. Um, there are a lot of films out there, and this is actually something which has changed over the years. So as we are talking, I can remember 20 years ago, you'd be four or five films a week. Now you're talking 12, 13, 14 films get released. Some of them only at one or two cinemas. There was an Emma Watson film a couple of weeks ago. Made £47 at the cinema. <laughs> £47. I went to see Allegiant at uh, Beaux Arts last night. That made more money at that single screening than an Emma Watson film did in its entire theatrical run in the UK. There's a lot more films out there. You would have hoped there'd be more room for more interesting approaches to life and people and uh just talking about channel islands pride a very interesting thing to come to go and see uh mm. something which hasn't happened before are you excited lauren i'm really excited we've been working very hard on it so we've got a few, a few events next week um we've got a broadway night on friday the 9th which is really really looking great um with kitty brocknell who came and performed at the exhibitionist ball We've got the main event on Saturday um, and an after party afterwards. We have a hangover brunch on the Sunday, which we're just before we factor that straight in. Yeah, you probably, yeah, probably for <laughs> <Yeah>. the best. <laughs> and then we have um, quite a few educational um, events during the week, and then we move to Jersey. So when's the when's the walk itself? Uh, that's on Saturday the 10th, next Saturday, Saturday. Saturday the 10th, fantastic. Well, it's been great catching up with you, and thank you very much for joining us, Lauren McSwiggan, Nick Delisle, and Winter, you're going to stay on to chat about the other films uh, in cinema at the moment, so mm. you're not going anywhere. I hope it's as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, looking at the lineup, there's a few which have disappointed, I think, but it's 10 to 11, it's BBC Radio Guernsey for now, let's have some music from The Carpenters.